you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God's own. thank you for saving us from so many ills that you reached out to us when we were walking away and you pursue us and you turned us and you're continual faithful to us lord um and we thank you for your love the amazing love that died on the cross for us um sinners um a king yourself um we just thank you for your love and we pray that you bless our service bless our morning um and praise in jesus name amen Okay, well, I thought, well, this is Thanksgiving week. I don't know if you guys are trying to, we try to do like a, on the calendar for a while, just put a thing thankful for each day of the calendar. So you kind of put that, fill it up. But uh, anyway, I thought it was appropriate. We're going through Colossians. I just want to read 319. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in deed, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So a lot of calls to be thankful. And so anyway, um, one of the things I'm thankful for today, and I'm just going to shout out to our harmonica player, Martin Trail. <laughs> Multifaceted Martin Trail is going to join us here. Martin's been such a great mentor to me and to my family, and I'm sure to your the church itself, just a great um, uh, uh, elder. And he's more elderly this week, right? You got more elderly? It was his birthday this week, so. <laughs> it only counts on your birthday, right? You're not getting older after that. All right, let me sing.
Faithful to the end. His mighty hand upholds me. By his grace I stand. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Smith. I'd like to welcome you all to Bridge Bible Fellowship. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, I have the pleasure of leading us through announcements and also recapping uh, Kirk's sermon from last week. So um, as you came in, you should have got a little pamphlet. That's our bulletin. It has information about who we are as a church, how to get connected, upcoming events. Um, there's a lot of good stuff on here, right? We have a lot of things coming up in the Advent season that I'd encourage you to take a look at. There's uh, hymn sing, psalm sings, um, Christmas parties for the youth group. You may have noticed that we have a Christmas tree in the back there. Um, that's the adoptive family. If you want to take a look at that, um, and if you want to participate, there's information here in your bulletin. Oh, I merged those two. That's the angel tree. Adoptive family is something separate. Look at those. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So over the past few weeks, we've been working through Paul's letter to the Colossians, and this is where he's encouraging them to continue to uh, mature in their faith, mature in their relationship with Christ, uh, in light of their new identity in him, relying on his strength and not their own. And last week, Kirk was taking us through the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, where Paul outlines how interpersonal relationships ought to work now in that new light. Uh, you know, it's t uh, fitting and timely for us now, and it was for them then. Uh, I think it's even more fitting as we think about coming into the Thanksgiving week, the holiday season, where we have a lot of close interaction with family and friends that uh, we have opportunity to show God's light. We also have opportunity to uh, be hypocrites. So, you know, it's important that we go into that and go into all interactions that way. So in this stretch of scripture, we're called to submit to each other. We're called to a self-sacrificial love that Paul outlines. Um, you know, we submit to our government, we submit to church leadership. Um, but this stretch of scripture, due to the sinful heart of man, is a hot button topic in our culture rather than an invitation for us to be more like Jesus who submitted to the will of the Father and paid our cost on the cross. Also, these lists of acts that we're called to are not conditional on the other party, right? We don't get to weasel our way out of submitting to one another or sacrificing for one another if we don't feel that coming from the other end, right? That's on us. 
Um, right, and it's on us because we are looking to honor our Heavenly Father, not our earthly masters. Kirk also tied this back to another gospel principle of restoration for when we do fail at this, right? So there's a process of asking for forgiveness, confession of sin, or extending forgiveness if you're the person shortchanged in that interaction. Um, so my main takeaways from the sermon were that if we have taken off our old identity or the dirty rags that uh, Paul outlines earlier in this letter and put on the mantle of Christ, then we're called to this action and to put on the posture of a self-sacrificial love in all of our interactions. Um, before I pray and dismiss the kids and for those who are doing Sunday school, um, Martin has an announcement. Yeah. Um, I'll have all the elders that are here come on up, and I'll, I'll just keep talking while you're walking. Um, but from time to time, you're going to hear it said from up here that if you have a question, ask one of the elders. And uh, to, to help you know who to ask, here we are. <laughs> and even if you don't have any questions, come up and meet us, because it's our hope that everyone here is going to make a connection and have a meet at some point with one of the elders. Uh, to make a personal connection with at least one of us. Because we believe that the gathering, that the church as we meet, it's so much more than just getting together and hearing a, a lecture about what's in the Bible or having a worshipful sing-along. It's more than that. It's about connecting and sharing our lives. So I'd like each one of you guys to share your name and greet everyone here, just <laughs> super quick, and then I'll keep going with my announcement. Just starting here. Yeah. Brett Corcatelli. I'm Kirk Brower. Jeff Allen, Tim Kirkland, Lauren Ewis, Gary Mitchum, Tim Tim Schultz, Nate Anglin. Hi. Andrew <laughs> <laughs> Smith. All right, and on the screen above, um, you're gonna were you able to get that well? Oh yeah. So I you'll see pictures of all of us, um, and this is from the updated website, uh, which went live just Thursday. So if you Ooh. haven't seen it, go there and look. There's been a ton of work been put into it, and while you're there, check out the small group section because there's a, a lot of really good, easy way to find out what the small groups are. And that's an excellent way to meet any of us if you wanna join one of our small groups, we'd love to have you and get to know you that way. And a quick word about how we as elders choose to operate. So the Bible gives a lot of latitude on how a church can operate. The way that we do it here is that all of us meet together once a month, and that's what we call the full board meeting. One of us volunteers to make breakfast. We all get together, but the main course is really we're praying for the spiritual health of the body, and we're praying for you individually. If you're in the directory, so pro tip is uh, <laughs> sign up for the directory, and if you need to know how to do that, ask one of the elders. <laughs> so, but those who are willing and able to teach also uh, meet a sec separate time monthly for the teaching team where we wrestle through and talk about how are we gonna be handling this passage of scripture and what to cover next and so forth. And then those who like to organize stuff, there's an administrative team that also meets once a month and uh, that's where we deal with the organizational things of the church. So, and then in addition to meeting one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'm for, we have a, an, uh, one, we do one-on-one -on -one pair ups in addition to these group meetings. And so for example, I'm currently, uh, this is the part, Brett. <laughs> This is a choreographed announcement, yeah. <laughs> so so we're, Brett and I are paired up this quarter, and so a couple weeks ago we got together and we hiked in the rain for a couple hours, and then we went to a, there's a place called Red Fur Tea Shop in Potlatch, and it was a great little breakfast place. And as we walked along and we ate breakfast together, we just talked about our lives. How are you doing? Are you burning out? Do you need some prayer? Do you have some praises you want to share? How are you getting along with your kid? How about your marriage? You know, all those kinds of things. And so it's been super meaningful. It was a sweet time that, that we got to spend together. Um, so I would ask all of you to please be praying for us uh, that we would be energized by God's spirit, that we'd be filled with his discernment as we work together to build up this body in love. Thank you. I'm done. And oh, hold on a second, before, wait. Before we let them all go, I'd like to pray. Yeah, yeah. Go for okay. It. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for this group of men. Thank you for um, their willingness to serve. Thank you that they have intentionally uh, set up a framework to seek to honor you and to, uh, as they lead our church. 
I pray that you'd be with Rhett specifically as he has a message to deliver to us. I pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds for that. And we just thank you for um, all the other volunteers that, that make this all possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Kids, you can be dismissed now if uh, you want to head down to Sunday school. You're all right. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun go back to shine. The God who called me here will be forever. So when Chris Trauma wrote that song, he left out a really important verse that everybody else in the music team thought we should include. So we're going to include it here. We've been here 10,000 years. When we've been here 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. You are God, there's no other, you are God, there's none like you, you may know the end from the beginning, before the beginning, there was you, and your purpose. 
the sun shall set to shout you all that you please from ancient times till now you stood by your decrees to pour out your love your mercy and your peace again. you are From the beginning, before the beginning, there was you, and your purposes shall stand, shall do all that you be. From ancient times till now, you stood by your decrees, pour out your love, your mercy, and your. in your deeds you are loving in your kindness that you poured out on me for you are God there's no other you are God there is none like you you may says shall stand and shall do all that you please from ancient times till now stood by your decrees to pour out your love your mercy and your You are gracious in your deeds. You are loving in your kindness. But you poured out on me. For you are God. There's no other. 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 I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, the Spirit lives within me, because you died and rose again, sing it, I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken.
Lord, you sacrificed for us. Um, we could never per per <laughs> pay you back for what you've done, Lord, but uh, we want to honor you with our, our lives, and, and we do want to be useful to you. Use me use this church, Lord, in this community, in this world as we reach out, Lord, to, to um, just glorify you, to bring others to you, Lord, and to uh, just praise you, Lord. We pray you'll continue to speak through us through uh, Brett, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, good morning, everyone. So this morning as I uh, arrived a good friend came up to me and said, oh, you're speaking today. And I thought, well, I'm, I had the microphone on, but I didn't. And he, he said, well, I could tell by the way you were dressed. <laughs> I, I don't know what that says about my off days. I think I need to step my game up, apparently. Um, but yeah, this morning, we're going to be continuing. Actually, we're going to be wrapping up our study through the letter to the Colossian church. And uh, as I was thinking about this, you know, I was thinking, I was going to ask you, you know, when's the last time that you went to a movie? You know, think about that. And when that movie was finished, you know, what did you do when the credits started to roll? You know, if you're like me, you probably stood up and looked around and made sure you had all your stuff and then headed for the exit. Why? Well, most of us don't shell out $15 to find out who the chief wardrobe consultant is, you know, or who the gaffer is, or my personal favorite, you know, who the best boy grip is on the current movie that you're watching. Most of us probably don't know what a best boy grip is, let alone care who it was that fulfilled that role in the movie you're watching. Well, this morning as we finish up our, our study through the book of Colossians, I think we're tempted to, to look at the end of Paul's letters in that same way, you know, as he lists out a whole bunch of people. 
and we think of them you know, kind of like the credits at the end of a movie. You know, something that we can either just kind of skim over or maybe skip all together. Well, I, think, I don't think I have to remind you, we're not in a movie theater this morning, and we're not reviewing the credits at the end of the movie. We're, we're reading the Word of God, right? And because it is God's Word, it is incredibly relevant, it is incredibly important, and has great value in our lives. All of it. Even those parts that might seem like they don't have as much relevance. In these last three verses in this letter, I think Paul is going to hit us with three more points that he wants us to take away from this. And I'm in a generous mood, so I'm going to go ahead and give you those three points right up front. I feel like I'm really loud. The three points that we're going to look at this morning that Paul challenges us to is to first make prayer a priority, and then to pursue lost people, and finally to value relationships with fellow believers. So before we get in and and dig into those a little deeper, let me pray. Lord God, we're so thankful that you have given us your word, that it is powerful, that it is true, that it is um, relevant to us even now. And we just pray, Lord, that as we spend time looking at how Paul wraps up this letter to this little church in Colossae, I pray that you would challenge each one of us right where we're at, that you would speak to our hearts in these areas and just help us to trust you more fully. We give you the glory, Lord, and we pray that you would, your spirit would be here very powerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you haven't already turned there, we're going to be um, in the fourth chapter of the book of Colossians, and we're going to pick up in verse 2. And this is what Paul says to us. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of God for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So the first thing that Paul tells us right off the bat, he says to make prayer a priority. In fact, he tells us to devote ourselves to prayer. I thought, devote, that's a very strong word. You know, what does it mean to devote yourself to something? So I, I went to the, the, web, the dictionary, and this is what Merriam-Webster says about devote. It says to devote is to give over or direct time, money, effort, or, or other things to a cause, an enterprise, or an activity. In essence, it's saying that we're devoted to those things that, we, that take up our time, that we spend our money on, that we put our efforts toward. And I don't doubt that at some point in your life you've heard it said that you could tell what's important to a person if you look at two things, right? If you look at their checkbook and their day planner, or probably more accurately nowadays, Google, their Google calendar. But the things that we spend our time on, the things that we spend our money on, the things that we put our efforts toward, those reveal the things that we value, the things that are important to us. And here Paul is encouraging believers, encouraging us to direct our time and to direct our efforts toward prayer, to value prayer, to make prayer a priority. And I think we could come up with a, a whole litany of excuses for why we don't prioritize prayer. I know I can. You know, work demands, family demands, just general overall busyness, exhaustion, or maybe it's something else for you. You can fill in the blank with whatever it is for you. And and if I'm speaking for myself, I think my single biggest hindrance to regular, consistent prayer is that I simply don't make it a priority, as Paul calls us to here. I allow other things to crowd out my prayer Or, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this, I simply choose other activities instead of prayer. And Paul is calling us here. He's saying, don't do that. Make prayer a priority. Don't allow your circumstances, don't allow the situations that you're in to keep you from prayer. Devote yourselves to it. I also think we have a tendency to only prioritize prayer when 
you know, our tanks are empty. When, when things are falling apart, when things are going poorly, uh, when we are desperate, in desperate need of God, then we'll take time to pray. Then we'll prioritize prayer. Well, I want to let you in on a little secret. We are always desperate for God, right? We're always desperate for God. There isn't a time in our lives when we don't need God to be interacting and inter intervening in our lives, that we don't need to be going to him and seeking his power in our lives. We always need him. And as we studied through the book of Colossians these last several weeks, Paul's challenged us to live out the reality of who we are in Christ. Uh, here's just a few in the last couple verses, or couple chapters. You know, he challenges us to continue in Christ, rooted and built up in him, to set our hearts and our minds on things above, to put to death the desires of our flesh, to put off our old self and to put on the new self, to let Christ's peace rule in our heart, to let Christ's words dwell in us richly. And then last week, as Kirk reminded us, to live differently as husbands, as wives, as children, as parents, as workers, as bosses. How do we, as Christ followers, do all this? How do we accomplish these things? Well, we don't, at least not on our own, not in our own strength. We desperately need God working in our lives if we're ever going to accomplish any of this stuff, if this stuff's going to be lived out in us. We need him. And that's why Paul emphasizes the need for us to devote ourselves to prayer. We need to seek God's will. We need to seek his direction. Most importantly, we need to seek his power through the spirit that he's placed in us to live this out. You know, prayer is, is one of the primary ways. I would say it's the primary way that God aligns our hearts with his, that he aligns our desires with his, and he aligns our perspectives and our motivations with his. You know, Paul adds a couple of additional words at the end of that first verse, right? He says that when we pray, we're to be watchful and we're to be thankful. Dude, to be watchful means that we're alert, that we're paying attention while we're praying, both looking for uh, people or things to pray for, but I think also, maybe more importantly, we're alert to what God is doing in those things that we're praying about. You know, how is God responding in our prayer, to our prayer? How is he answering our prayers? You know, when Paul prayed, I have no doubt that he believed, that he knew that God was going to respond to his prayer. I want to ask you, do you pray with that kind of confidence? When you go to God, do you have the confidence that he is going to respond? You know, having that confidence doesn't mean that God's always going to answer our prayers in the way that we want. It doesn't mean that God is going to answer our prayers in the timing that we want him to. But I do believe that he will always answer. And we can have confidence in that. We can have confidence that when he does answer, it's always going to be for our good and for his glory, even when it doesn't line up with what I want. And when we have this confidence, it should lead us right into that second word that Paul uses, thankful. You know, we should be thankful when we pray. Pray, Thankful that the God of the universe hears us. You know, that he is listening to us. As a good father, he desires for us to come to him in prayer. He longs for our prayers. That is a lot to be thankful for. Honestly, you know, that in and of itself, should be all the motivation that we need to pray, to devote ourselves to prayer. Knowing that the God of the universe, the one who created and sustained us, the one who died to save us, that he longs for us to come to him. He longs for us to come and have conversation and communion with him. I mean, that's amazing. So make prayer a priority, Paul says. Well, the next thing that Paul encourages us to do, he encourages us to pursue lost people. You know, look at uh, starting in verses 3 and 4. Paul continues to highlight the importance of prayer, but now he does so in the context of his ministry of preaching the gospel. Paul understands that he 
can't accomplish anything. None of us can accomplish anything in the lives of unbelievers apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And so he invites the Colossian church to join with him in his ministry by praying for him and for praying for those that are with him as they minister the gospel, as they share the gospel with unbelievers. He specifically asks them to pray that he's able to present the gospel clearly as God gives him opportunity. And just a few minutes ago, I had mentioned how prayer is the primary way that God aligns our hearts with his. And I think, you know, nothing is more in line with the heart of the Father than his desire to bring his children back into relationship with him. And that's why all of us are here this morning, right? Because God pursued us when we weren't pursuing him. He drew near to us when we, when we wanted nothing to do with him. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, as we learned back in chapter one. And God often uses his people to accomplish that goal in the lives of other people. You know, he uses his people to help draw the lost back to him. Now imagine if you guys think back to your salvation story, you know, when you came to Christ, you could probably pinpoint at least one person, maybe multiple people who were influential and instrumental in helping you to come to that point where you surrendered your life to Christ. And in verses five and six, Paul's encouraging us. He's encouraging you and he's encouraging me to be those people for others. He says that we're to be those people in two different ways. He says, first, we're to be wise in how we act toward outsiders. And then he says that our conversation or our words should be full of grace. You know, Paul says that our behavior and our words should be working together as we interact with those around us that our words and our actions should complement each other as we strive to impact those that we're in contact with. But when that's not the case, when the way that we live doesn't line up with what we profess to believe, um, people certainly notice that. And I think that's why Paul emphasizes the need for our actions and our words to work together. Um, there's a quote from a, a guy, a gentleman named Brennan Manning. Um, I only heard Knew, was aware of this quote because it's at the beginning of an old DC talk song. Lauren, Lauren's probably familiar with it. <laughs> but in that, at the beginning of that song, he says this. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, we can debate whether that's true or not, but I think the point is that our, our actions and our words need to line up, right? If you're like me, I read a verse like this, or a quote like this, sorry, and I think to myself, oh boy, you know, there's a, often where my actions, where the way I live doesn't always line up with what I profess to believe. So maybe it's best if I don't even try to witness to others, because I don't want to be a hypocrite, right? I don't want to come across as a hypocrite. Well, I want to set your mind at ease if you're thinking like me, that when Paul says that we're to be wise in how we act toward outsiders, it doesn't mean that we have to do everything perfectly. You know, we know that this side of heaven, we're not going to achieve perfection. But it does mean that we simply live out these truths in humility that we try to leave these things out that we've been talking about in Colossians the last several weeks in humility and trust and dependence upon God and his power. You know, we're striving in God's power, not our own, through the work of the Holy Spirit to be different, you know, to live out these things that we talked about earlier, right? But we need to do it. We need to try to live these things out in humility, as I mentioned, knowing that we're going to stumble you know, that we're going to struggle we're going to fall short at times, which is where our words come in, right? Our words need to, to be seasoned with salt. You know, Paul says that our conversation is full, to be full of grace and in humility. When we speak to others, we do so with grace and humility. We, we recognize that Jesus is still at work in us, right? He hasn't completed his work. He is working in us, 
And that we don't have to be perfect. That we just need to be real. That we need to be authentic. You know, we need to be willing to admit to others that we aren't perfect. That we don't have it all together. But we are forgiven. And we are loved. That is not going to change. And then we can introduce them to the one who is perfect. And then they can hopefully experience that love and forgiveness as well. You know, we live in a world where people are hurting, uh, where people are lonely, uh, where they're hopeless. And oftentimes, from the outside, it doesn't look like that. You know, I was talking to Kirk this week about that. We, we have a mutual friend who puts on a good front and acts like he has it all together. But deep down, he's hurting. He's got some, some struggles. And we're trying to encourage him. You know, people need the good news. They need hope. They need Jesus. And Paul says that we could be those people that help point them to him. So now we've seen, first, the, the importance of making prayer a priority and, and the importance of pursuing lost people. Now we're going to look at that third point, which is to value relationship with fellow believers. Picking up in verse 7, it says, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he was working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see to it that it is also read, uh, see to that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Okay, so, so this is the part I was referring to at the beginning, right? We tend to skim over this because it, it kind of has a feel of the credits at the end of the movie. You know, Paul's like, this letter brought to you by, and he lists out a whole bunch of people. You know, some of them we're familiar with. You know, Luke, Barnabas, and Mark. Others, maybe not as much. Uh, Tychicus, he's mentioned in Ephesians, and Onesimus, he's mentioned also in Philemon, if you want to know more about him. Uh, some of these other guys we don't know very much about at all. Are, um, Aristarchus, Justus, Epaphras, Demas, Nymphus, Archippus. You know, Paul mentions in this short little section, 11 different people. And why do they think he goes through and mentions all these people? Well, I think it's because he wants to demonstrate that we need each other. You know, we need the encouragement and support of other believers in our lives. If we truly want to live out the life we've been called to in Jesus Christ, we need fellow believers alongside us. Christianity is a team sport. It's meant to happen in community. We need each other. And here, Paul, arguably the greatest evangelist that ever lived, lived, demonstrates this truth for us. He surrounded himself with other believers. You know, Tychicus, just to, to call out one, both here and in Ephesians, Paul says that he is being sent that he might encourage the hearts of the church that he's being sent to. And this guy must have been an incredible encourager. To me, that says Paul needed encouragement. You know, others the, he calls dear brothers. He calls them faithful servants. He says they are a comfort to him. Paul needed these men and women in his life to serve with, to pray with, 
and to do life with. And we need that too. I do. I know I need it. I need encouragement. And I imagine you guys do too. I need people in my life who's gonna, who will come alongside of me who don't just encourage me, but who challenge me, who teach me, who pray for me and pray with me, who know me and love me. And one of the best ways to develop these relationships, you hear it often, in fact, Martin mentioned it this morning, one of the best ways to develop these relationships is to get into a small group. If you're not in one, get involved. Um, Martin mentioned the new website, and I encourage you to go there. I counted last night, there's 24 different small groups currently available. So, so take that opportunity. You know, I've been uh, blessed to be in a small group, and uh, it's filled with, with a bunch of godly people who encourage me and challenge me, who shed tears with me, who prayed for me and prayed with me, and I hope I've done the same for them. And then, you know, earlier, you, you saw the elders up here, right? And I just want you guys to know, um, Martin mentioned some of the things that we do, but I, I want you guys to know how blessed you are to have men like these that are, that are serving you and praying for you. Um, I just want to say that we love you. We love each and one of you, genuinely. And we want the best for you. We want to see you growing in your relationship with Christ and your trust in him. So as Martin mentioned, we pray for you regularly. And we want to get to know you. Yeah, I'm gonna, I feel like I'm repeating a lot of what Martin said. We didn't plan that. Um, we do want to get to know you, and we try to do that after church, but it's hard. I mean, there's 10 of us, and there's hundreds of you. You know, we've gone to three services now, and we want to connect with you. So I want to encourage you, you know, as we try to get around and meet you, I want to challenge you, be bold and come and talk to us. I want to offer, personally, a free cup of coffee. I'll buy you a cup of coffee, and we can sit down and chat. I'd love to get to know you better. And if you talk to Kirk, don't listen to what he says, but Kirk will say that what I drink isn't really considered real coffee. <laughs> so you have to promise not to tease me about what I'm drinking. And if you can promise that, I'll buy you your favorite beverage and we can chat and get to know each other better. And I'm going to throw it out and I'm going to put it on all the other elders too. They would love to do the same. So come, come hit us up. So as we wrap up this morning, I think the application is pretty clear, right? It's the same three points that I made to start off, that we need to, to make prayer a priority, we need to pursue lost people, and we need to value relationship with fellow believers. And to end, I just want to give you a few practical ideas in each of these areas to, to prime the point, this, to prime the pump. This isn't an exhaustive list, but this is just to get your juices flowing on how you might personally um, apply some of these areas in your life. So first, uh, making prayer a priority. I encourage you, set aside a consistent time. Find a time that works for you and make that your time of prayer. That you can consistently spend time with God, connecting and communing with him. Uh, second, maybe get a, a journal and record some of the things that you're praying about, things you're praying for. Because then you can review it, you can go back and you can see how God is responding. You know, how God is answering those prayers and it, it can encourage you and build that, that thankfulness that we talked about. Third, I'd say, um, this is a twofer, gather some other people to pray. You know, this covers both making prayer a priority and valuing relationship with other believers. So extra credit points for that one. But it's just a great time to get to know other people and to be encouraged as you pray together. The second one, pursuing lost people, I'd say first and foremost, refer to point number one, pray. Pray and ask God to give you a heart that is soft and compassionate toward lost people. I think that there's a tendency for us to look at them as the problem when sin is the problem and they are just as needy as we were before we came to Christ. So pray for that heart. Pray that God would soften your heart. And then secondly, focus on the people that are in your circle that are close to you, um, your neighbors. You know, if you don't know your neighbors, go introduce yourself. Get to know them. Uh, your coworkers, you know, spend some time in deeper conversation than just the weather and sports. Although, by the way, go Vandals. That was a heck of a game yesterday. <laughs> and then if you're super, super, super brave, take that next step and invite them into your home. 
invite them into your house for dinner to get to know them better. It just makes that connection that much deeper. And then finally, third one is, is valuing relationships with fellow believers. As I mentioned before, and you hear the drum beat repeatedly up here, get involved in a small group. If you're not in one, it's just a fantastic way to develop relationships and to allow people to know you and for you to know them on a deeper level. Second, encourage each other. You know, we're called to that throughout scripture. Maybe drop someone a note. You know, writing notes is a lost art. So drop someone a note of encouragement. Tell them you've been thinking about them and praying for them. Um, if somebody shares something with you, make it a point to follow up with them on that. Don't just pray about it and then never follow up. And then the third one, this is just kind of a random idea. We just had date with eight not too long ago. Um, you don't have to wait for us to do it corporately. You know, do a little mini date with eight on your own. Find a few people that you've met that you want to get to know better and invite them over. You could do a, an impromptu potluck, and, but make it an intentional time. <coughs> you know, ask some good questions. If you, if you need an idea on those, talk to Martin. He's got tons and tons of questions. So that's it. You know, that's what, we, what Paul calls us to as we wrap up the book of Colossians. As the credits roll, Paul challenges us to make prayer a priority, to pursue lost people, and then to value relationships with fellow believers. So let me pray. Lord God, we're so thankful that you pursued us first and foremost, that you um, chased after us and you brought us back into your family, that you've redeemed us and forgiven us, Lord, and that you call us um, in the same way to, to, to desire and develop relationship with you, to pursue those who are far from you as we once were, and then to just rejoice in the fellowship of the believers that you've allowed us to be a part of. So. Lord, help us to do that all the more for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Brother Predicus. Give you a more biblical name. Corey Thomas. Uh, all right, let's all stand up again. The love of God is greater far than time or can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win his every child he reconciled and pardoned down his king oh love of God how rich and pure how measured it shall forevermore endure the sense and name song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly joys and kingdoms fall. When men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains fall. God's love so sure shall still endure. with something about Thanksgiving and um, 
So I'm just going to read Psalm 100, and if you know Mike Jacobs, he'd probably want us to sing it. Um, so I'll try it from singing it, but uh, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his go- gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The Lord is good, his steadfast love, he pursues us. Be thankful this week, right? What a great week, and we should live our lives and pray with thanksgiving, right? We could put that on the list. Um, We have so many things to be thankful for, so praise God. Safe travels, and have a great week.